basically it felt like I was in a computer game like my whole life so like you know when you're like playing a first person shooter game and there's like that separation you know like there's a screen and then there's you it feels like the entire world looks like that like it feels like you're not real Hello and welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health, a free safe space for people to share and learn from others' experiences with mental health and addictions. I'm Todd Rennebaum, suicide attempt survivor and a recovering substance abuser. I've got another amazing guest this week. This week I'm speaking with Leandra Graves and she is the lead singer of the band Graves and the Bad Weather and she's going to discuss her ailments of OCD, depression, PTSD, and something that I find fascinating, a little something called depersonal, I can't say it, depersonalization. I don't know why, I I have trouble saying that all throughout the episode. But anyway, speaking of OCD, Saturday, June 8th, 2024, there's going to be an OCD walk in Toronto. And if you register and you're able to raise $150, you get a chance to win two tickets to see Taylor Swift free November 23rd in Toronto. I will put that in the show notes, but if you just want to go ahead right now and check out sunnybrook.ca, there's information there. Thank you so much for a brand new sponsor. They are the Canadian Center for Addictions. They're Canada's luxury private rehab. If you or someone you know is struggling, please give them a call at 1-855-971-0515. They are located in Ontario, and there's also going to be a link in the show notes. Please use that link. Check them out. Uh, Even if you're just kicking around the idea, uh, please go check it out. Do yourself and a loved one a favor and check out Canadian Center for Addictions. The number again is 855-971-0515. And if you're loving this podcast, thank you so much for listening and thank you for supporting it. Uh, it means a lot to me. I, lots of people are getting lots of things from my guests, so uh, I consider it a, a mental health service. Uh, if you want to support the podcast, there's links in the show notes to to buy merch or to buy me a coffee, things like that. Uh, that'd be great. Or if you could just share, rate and review, that'd be amazing too. Speaking of amazing, my guest is amazing. So without further ado, I give you... Leandra Graves. Well, I guess one interesting thing was um, I have so I have four siblings. I'm the oldest, and when we were young, my we were homeschooled. So I was homeschooled my entire life. Um, my mom really had this vision of us that we would be like like little house on the prairie type stuff, like those type of homeschoolers. And, um, obviously by looking at me, I'm not like that. (laughs) So (laughs) that was, that was always, um, a wrestling match, I guess, with me and her was she wanted me to be one way. And I came out just like a completely different way. So that, that was kind of a theme through most of my life. When I got to high school, she was more like with the surface level things, like the piercings and stuff. She was like, okay, whatever, like, we'll do that. Were, were you homeschooled the whole, you were whole schooling? Yeah. From oh, okay. Kindergarten okay. to when I graduated high school. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. But um, I've always been very extroverted. So I made tons of friends, like regardless. So I grew up doing theater and I went to church. So I was really involved in that. And then I did music and um, I would honestly just kind of like walk down to the schools when they let out and make friends. <laughs> <laughs> Like, um, I'm the lady that, li- I'm the lady, I'm the kid that lives over there. I don't get to play with kids all day. Yeah, I'd be like, yeah. Hey, what's up you guys? I'm bored. <laughs> what kind of church did you go to? Uh, it was a, it considered non-denominational, but, um, those usually end up being their own denomination. <laughs> right. So very strict church. Um, I don't go there anymore for a multitude of reasons. I still, um, believe like in God and everything. I just... I don't have any interest in that church anymore. Gotcha. Yeah. Was was that a, did it leave a bad taste in your mouth? Yeah. I mean, it, it bothers me when churches, they like add to scripture, you know? So like, mm-hmm. 
the Bible will say this, but then the pastor will be like, I know it says this, but I'm going to add this and I don't do this. And if you do it, I'm not going to judge you, but I would never do that. You know? And I'm like that, that's weird. Like, I also don't like the church model where one person is in charge of everything. Cause I feel like it can get really corrupt really quickly. Real culty real yes, quick. Yes. A hundred percent. Very culty. And mm-hmm. like, it actually, <laughs> it took me years. My husband telling me, he was like, you were kind of in a cult. And I was like, no, I wasn't like, what are you talking about? Like they, they were weird, but, and he was like, no, you were in a cult. Cause he grew up Jehovah's witness. So he was like, no, I know. <laughs> like, <laughs> trust me, that was a cult. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> you might yeah. be right. You might be right. Yeah. Hmm. But, um, so, so your mom kind of eased up a bit on piercings and stuff in high school. It's, it's so weird to call it even high school when it's like, at home. <laughs> I know. I know. High school years, I guess. <laughs> right, yeah. I know. But um, I guess w- when things started to go like bad was when I was around like 11 or so. So like me and my dad were always like pretty close as a kid. Like I definitely was a tomboy. So and my dad was like the less strict of the two parents, you know, so I like enjoyed being around him. <sighs> but when I was like junior high, he just started like, he just started getting this rage inside of him and just like screaming at me. But like, I only have flashes of like certain nights, you know, cause it went on for a very long time, but where basically I knew if I was home in the evening and he was home, it was going to end up somehow that I was going to be screamed at for hours. And there was nothing I could do to get out of it. Like, like I said, I'm kind of strong willed. So like at first I would like scream back and fight back and all that. And I quickly learned that there was no fighting it. Like it would just, it was just going to keep going, you know? So then I like switched to the tactic of like, okay, I'm sorry, like quickly. And that wouldn't stop it either. It would just keep going, keep going, keep going. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> like, this really sucks. I don't know why this started happening, you know? And it, it was, was direct- it with just you or your siblings too? Just me and my mom. Oh yeah, yeah. That was what made it even kind of more confusing. Cause I mean, every once in a while, like my siblings would fuck up or whatever. And he'd like yell at them, but I, they were never the object of his just direct rage at night. You know, that, that was something that happened consistently and all the time. And obviously that, made me incredibly depressed, you know, and confused and anxious. And well, yeah, it's, it's a form of abuse when you're constantly on eggshells around someone and, and they either stonewall you or they're icing you out or they're attacking you and there's no rhyme, no reason. So you think you have it figured out, but they don't. And And it's like, yeah, you're constantly just fight or flight mode on eggshells and, not feeling good about yourself really. Yeah, absolutely. And I still carry that to this day, like the fight or flight thing or like, like, um, Mm. what did it, the PTSD symptom, like hyper, were you like hypervigilance where like, if Mm. I hear any sort of raised voice, like today, like I kind of freeze and like have to figure out where it is. Cause that's what Mm -hmm. I did all growing up. I would just hear it somewhere in the house. And I was like, fuck, (laughs) where is it? Mm. Where's it coming from? Where's it coming to what's going to happen? You know? The reason I can't talk about this is because since then, me and my dad have um, talked about it and he's apologized and everything. So we actually do have a decent relationship now. Like mm, we talk good. and stuff and I've forgiven him and all that. So, but um, he. So does it feel like you're throwing him under the bus when you talk about it? No, because I've asked him. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've asked him if I can talk about it. And since it's always to a purpose, you know, I'm never just trying to like talk shit. You know, right? you said it's okay as long as it can like get out there and help people like overall. And since it's relevant to like the mental disorders I have, then, you know, it's like I said, it's to a purpose. Right. Gotcha. Good. Well, that's nice. I never wanted to come across like I'm just like slamming, you know, my family, but it is just Mm -hmm. the truth of what happened. Mm-hmm. Your kids will do it to you one day. Oh, I'm so. sure. If I ever. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I keep cut, cutting you off. That's okay. Please continue. Um, yeah, I got to the point where there were there were nights where I would just um, like my family would be downstairs watching TV, and I would just choose to go up and stay in my room 
because I knew if I was down there, it was going to cause an eruption. And that was a really, really lonely place to be. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, well, what's what's wrong with me, you know? And again, that's something that I still carry with me to this day is what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? <laughs> you know, uh, even with my, my mom, like not understanding me, like, like I'm a night owl, you know, and that would freak her out. Like, cause she's a morning person. So like it, sorry, mom. But one thing I heard a lot throughout my life is what is wrong with you? This isn't normal. What's wrong with you? This isn't normal, you know? Hmm. And that like, that's a really hard thing to get out of your head. You know, something's like, wrong with me. I'm not normal. Yes. Like yeah. I was talking to my husband about something the other day and it always like once I like come around to the point, it always ends up with, oh, I'm a piece of shit or oh, I'm a bad person, you know, and OCD doesn't help with that. It loves that. It clings on to that. But I I've acknowledge it. I've been like, it's it always comes back to that. And that's so one, it's frustrating because every time I realize it, I immediately forget. <laughs> and then it like the chatter starts again. But mm-hmm. yeah, that that's a that's a huge theme in my life. Right. Uh and I mean I've done lots of therapy and stuff for stuff. Uh and it's true, it is like even though you know why a lot of this stuff is happening, you still get caught up doing those that negative self-talk and all that stuff again. It, it is better though, because then you are self-aware enough, even if it's, you know, better late than never that you're like, Oh, right. Right. Okay. This is, uh, this is just because of, um, you know, my OCD or because of what, how, what my parents said to me, but, mm-hmm. but, but then you've, but for me, even when I do that, then I feel like shit even worse. It's like, I should know better. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. Yeah. That's where I am right now, actually. Like today and yesterday, I'm just like, God damn it, I should fucking know this. I'm sorry, am I allowed to cuss? Big time. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I should fucking know this by now. Like, God, these lessons. Oh, you can't say that one. Which, no, I'm kidding. Which one? <laughs> Not that I'm just being a smart ass. <laughs> oh, okay. <Sorry. laughs> I can't even know. <laughs> so yeah so then it, it just recycle it, it, it restarts a, a cycle again of negative talk because like i'm such a piece of shit i should know i'm not a piece of shit yes wait what wait <laughs> yeah. no a hundred percent like yeah hmm. yeah and i was i was doing um one of my my clients what told me because i had a lot of problem obviously with self-love you know and self-hate she told me to like look in the mirror and say like, I love you and like, you're beautiful and things like that. And it's like really, really weird to do, but I did it for a while and it really did help. And then, but I have this horrible habit of once something works, then I stop doing it. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Maybe have ADHD too. <laughs> I would not be surprised. I would be surprised if I didn't. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm actually supposed to get um, assessed for that soon, but I keep forgetting to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. That sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the first question on the test, actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you keep forgetting to get assessed? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> That's worth 50 marks right there. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, when did you start feeling the effects of OCD and like, when did that start to creep in? So it's hard to say because I, I think it's kind of been with me my whole life. Um, it didn't get really bad to where I got diagnosed until I was like 28 though. So, yeah. So growing up, I always had intense anxiety and panic attacks and PTSD symptoms from when my dad was doing all that. Um, I think he had had a drinking problem at the time, which came out. So that was Mm. causing a lot of that. And then I think just not knowing how to handle a teenager, you know, for the first time, but, um, yeah, all through high school, it was just anxiety, depression. That was all that I knew that I had, but I've always had this like compulsion where like, I can't lie, you know? And like, I have very strong like morals, you know, where I don't bend them at all. And growing up in church, that was just like, no, good. That's a good thing, you know? And it is, but it was like, like the guilt was so strong. It was like, I've since come to find out it's not normal. Like how strong the the guilt was you know 
Well, they say that's a form of OCD is actually like that religious faith. Yeah. Thing. It's like, I'm going to hell unless I do this, this, and this. And it, to the point that it's like controlling your behavior and mm-hmm. your day and hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. There's a whole um, subset of OCD called scrupulosity and it, that's like all religion based where like you either have horrible thoughts about religion or like you, you, you like have to do things a certain way or you're going to burn, you know, those kind of things. Mm-hmm. But it, yeah, it wasn't until I was, um, I think it was 28. Well, the first, okay. It's hard to say. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I'm going to just go with 28 because it, OCD shows up in so many different ways. Like people, including myself, aren't aware of like, it's not being tidy. It's not being neat. Like my whole apartment's mess, you know, like it has nothing to do with like what's shown on television 99% of the time. Like it's like, there's something about your brain that's misfiring. Like it's an actual thing in your brain that's not acting correct. So like mine showed up as it's called relationship OCD. That was, this is the thing that made me seek help because it's shown up in tons of different, different facets, but it's where like you're in a relationship and everything's great. And all of a sudden you just like, either you see somebody else that you find attractive and then like all these lights go off in your head where you're like, Oh my God, did I find that person attractive? Are they more attractive than my partner? Oh my God. Do I actually want this? What do I want? No, I don't want it because of this. No, I want it because of that. It's an endless, endless fucking loop. And then anything and everything having to do with your relationship is just triggering, triggering, triggering. And it feels like you become obsessed with other people almost like that's what it feels like that's why I was like oh my god like I don't like this because I I'm married and I love my husband so I was like I don't understand what's happening right now like it it wasn't even people that I knew intimately it was just like some someone would get stuck up here ding ding and then just pinballs in my head and what you immediately do is you start analyzing the thoughts, you know, cause you want to solve this problem because it's a problem. And with almost every other problem in life, you think about it and you solve it. Right. Mm-hmm. With OCD, that's like the worst thing you could do. Cause that turns into rumination and rumination <laughs> sends your brain a signal that no, this actually is a big deal. You are in danger. You, the thing you love the most is threatened. So it's going to send more anxiety and the anxiety just grows, 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 grows pretty like exponentially until you do something about it. But that's where you get stuck because you're like, what do I do? I've been doing talk therapy. I've talked to my husband about this. Like I've cut everybody out of my life, you know, that like could possibly send my brain an anxiety buzz, you know, and absolutely nothing is working. Mm. And that's, that's when I... You obsess. <laughs> oh, just, yeah, just. <laughs> the old part. <laughs> yeah. And I can't, mm. I, I could never even verbally explain how all encompassing that word obsession is. Cause it has nothing to do with like, oh, I'm obsessed with this thing right now. I can't stop thinking about it. I mm. love it. Like, like I'm obsessed. I just obsessed about sushi right now. Obsessed. Like I'm obsessed. <laughs> it's so much more horrible than anything I could have ever imagined which is why I never imagined that it would be OCD because it's never shown like that, you know, right. It's always shown completely differently. It's like they're washing their hands and flicking the light switches. Yes. And And that, that can be a thing, you know, I have uh, that pop up that are like that, but those aren't, aren't by any means my, my biggest triggers. I was like, I have to do something about this because I can't live this way. Like every day I would wake up and just like, bombarded with like the sharpest anxiety that you could ever think of. And just like, I would just want to cry all day. Like you could barely go to work. So then I found, um, the, the gold standard for OCD treatment is ERP therapy, the exposure response prevention therapy. Hmm. And then I went on to do that. I guess that would be the the next chapter. <laughs> but, chapter two. Well, or but three. I, I kind of want to go back. I just, what was, how many things OCD can be at once? Cause like, yeah, the relationship. So it tends to like attack what's most important to you. I have come to find. So 
if the ROCD stuff, the relationship OCD, if that just stops bothering you, it'll whoop, switch to something else. And like, it could be scrupulosity. It could be, um, harm OCD, like where people are afraid they're going to like jump off a building. Yeah. Or hurt their best yeah. friend or kill the kid oh, or right. all the Yeah. Things. That's very common with uh postpartum depression. Some women yes. have a, they like cannot leave their baby alone or don't want to be alone with their baby because they're worried they're going to harm their baby. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, they're probably not. It's just for whatever reason, that's their OCD. Yeah. Yeah. I've also heard of like, am I gay? Am I gay? Yes. Oh God. Well, I can't, I can't remember what that was called. It's like, called H-O-C-D, I think. I'm not sure why. But yeah, it's where you, you constantly are obsessing over your sexual orientation. It's like, I looked at that guy's butt. Am I gay? Yes. Oh no. But I like women. What does this mean? <laughs> like, but I think I like yeah. women, but do I? But I saw that one guy once and I had that thought, but no, everybody has that thought. Yeah. It just. Yeah. It, it's so weird because it's like almost automatic. It just like goes and just. But, but it's not just a thought. Like you said, it's like panic anxiety thinking and then you obsess. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Yeah. It's utter, utter panic. Ugh, I hate it. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there, there are like 11 subsets of it, but it's all the same thing. Like that I have existential OCD sometimes where I'm like afraid I'm like not real. And that, that's a really weird one. That one's really scary. So I, I don't know, but, um, yes. So that, that so, sorry, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I, no, I want you to go ahead. <laughs> well, I to say that that's like what OCD is. So that's, I feel like it's important for people to know because a lot of people have it and don't know it and think that they're a bad person. Like I did, I was like, I'm just a terrible person. Like, why do I have these people in my head? You know, like this is not my values. This doesn't align with anything to do with me, but it must be me. Therefore bad person. Hmm. I remember being a kid, probably 11 to uh, probably stopped around 16 years old. I had probably, I would say OCD tendencies. The more I learned, I've learned about it. Yeah. Um, and I do like, I mean, weird things like, yeah. And weird rituals and things I would do in my head. And if I didn't do them, I would, I couldn't sleep because I'd have anxiety. It's like, oh shit, I've got to, yeah, yeah, just weird stuff. But I do remember kind of like kind of growing out of it and thinking, this is nuts. Like, why do I do this to myself? Like, and I was able to get out of it saying that it, that switch turned into, yeah, something else. It turned into like, addictions and other things yeah. so it, didn't, it didn't just go away it was like it just morphed into some other thing but oh yeah um so i, I kind of relate because i was I, yeah I, I would never say i had ocd but i think i had some i could have kept going down that path but um yeah but then i was introduced to alcohol <laughs> <laughs> that'll distract you that's for sure <laughs> yeah. um, anyway uh so What's the next chapter? So next chapter is I, I end up. Yeah. So I was telling my husband, I'm like, this is, this is terrible. This is terrible. I need to do something. Obviously it was like weeks of me saying I need to do something before I was going to do something because possible ADHD, maybe, I don't know. And he was like, no, you need to do something. And I was like, you're right. No, you're right. I'm going to do something. And like, it's always scary seeking out therapy because it costs money, you know? And like, like, you know, I didn't have a lot of money, but thank God, like I, I found that, and it's not a plug, I'm not associated with this app at all, but I went through the no CD app. So it's just an app that I downloaded on my phone that they do therapy through. So they do like zoom therapy and this was a few years ago, but, um, the, they were charging what I could afford. So it was affordable for me. I could actually do it, you know, and it was like six 90 minute sessions and then like three hour long sessions or something. Basically the therapist like gets to know you gets to know your form of OCD and then teaches you how to do um, exposure response prevention therapy and does it with you that way. Cause it's very confusing, you know, and very upsetting <laughs> like while you're doing it very, very painful. So I did that and, um, 
it took a long, 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 long time, but it does work. So I found out that it does work. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, and it, what, what does that look like that, like type of therapy? So exposure therapy. So it's basically, you put yourself in a situation you would hate to be in and learn to the, the, the therapist walks you through it and helps you. Essentially. And then, and then you're like, Oh, it wasn't nothing bad happened. Right. Uh, mm, kind of thing. I wouldn't say that that's the thought I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's it in a nutshell, right? <laughs> kind of. So it, it, it's more returning your brain. Like mm, the okay. parts of your brain that you don't control really. So let's, let's use like harmo CV as, as an example. Like if you're say the situation, like your most common obsession is I'm going to stab my best friend. I know it. I know I'm going to hurt them. I don't want to blah, blah, blah. So what they'll do is they'll sit with you and they'll be like, okay, tell me everything about that thought. And then they'll gather like your triggers. So they'll be like, okay, well this, the, saying the the phrase, I'm going to stab my best friend, that sends your anxiety through the roof, right? You can be like, yeah, and like normally you're just like sobbing during this part because you never say it out loud, you know? They're like, okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to say, I'm going to stab my best friend, and this is the key, you are not going to react to it. And by reacting, they mean you are not going to analyze that thought. You're not going to make excuses for that thought. You're not going to ask anyone for reassurance. You are literally just going to sit with that thought. So it says, I'm going to stab my best friend, but no buts. I'm going to stab my best friend. Well, what? No. And while you're doing that, the anxiety goes up, 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 like all the way to the top. And then you have to hang in there while the, the anxiety is all the way at the top and it can last for however minutes, however long. And then you keep saying it, keep sticking with it, not responding. Eventually the anxiety starts to come back down and you wait till it's like back down middle ish. It won't come all the way down, at least not at first. It'll come back down a little bit and then you can move on to the next thought. So it's basically like standing at the edge of, at the edge of a cliff and like jumping off, but not knowing like that you're actually one foot off the ground. Mm, you know, mm-hmm. like that's what it genuinely feels like that it feels like you're going to die, but mm. fun. Oh, it's the best, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. Mm. It works. Cause it shows since you're not responding to the thoughts, it's showing your brain. Oh, okay. I guess we can stop sending her these alarms because your brain's trying to protect you because it's something you're terrified of. So it's going to keep sending it to you. But if you stop reacting, it's, you know, shitty as it feels, then eventually it stops sending those signals. And, and sometimes it'll like freak out and start like sending other weird signals and like, just like, you know, but you just got to stick through it and stick with it. And when I have had the most success is when I am continuously doing um, ERP therapy, even when I am not like with a, with a counselor. Well, yes. So the, oh. whole, the whole point of the no CD stuff is to train you to do it yourself. Gotcha. Okay. And that way you do it for pretty much ever because OCD is a, considered a chronic um, mental disorder. But I do know people that believe that you can fully recover. It. I think it depends how much you do the exposures. And since I have an issue with um, doing things that I'm supposed to when I feel good, I tend to run into the trap where I'm like, Oh my God, I'm having like an OCD attack. It feels like the first time I've ever had one. And I'm like, "Fuck, I need to go do exposures and then I'll do one and then I'll feel better. And then I'll stop. And then it's just a cycle. I need to eventually, right. Right. (laughs) Eventually I'm going to hold of that. Right. Right. I, I see. So it's like, instead of consistently doing maintenance, it's like you, it's all or nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's scary. Like I'm like I don't want to cuz it it's just the the anxiety that comes with OCD is so painful like I'm like, well, I don't want to do that to myself on purpose, you know, cuz I will feel anxious when I do an exposure. But I was talking to my husband last night. I just broke down crying cuz it was just like building up again and I was telling him just that. I was like, I don't want to do that to myself on purpose. And he was like, yeah, but do you want to feel like this? And I was like, no. No, I don't. He's like, okay, well, the exposures, yeah, they feel awful for a short amount of time. Or you could just not do them and feel awful all the time, 
you know? Yeah. It's like ripping the Band-Aid off quick or yes. slowly p- peeling it off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, essentially. Mm-hmm. So either way, it sucks. Yeah, either way, In it way. sucks. <laughs> um, it does suck less to do the exposures because, you know, the more you do them, the less they hurt. <laughs> right, but right. It's like working out. Like, I don't want to work out either because it sucks. <laughs> but I don't want to be fat either. So it also sucks. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so um, so what's the next chapter then? Because um, I, I am curious about your de- re- reper- depersonalization. Yes. Yes. Bunny Hugs and Mental Health is supported by Co-op. I've been a member of my local co-op, Sherwood Co-op, for about 20 years. If you live in Western Canada, especially the prairies, or spend any time here, you've probably fueled up or bought groceries at a co-op. You might even have a co-op number, or two, or three. You know if you know. But co-op is not just a gas bar or a grocery store. Although co-op is those things too, it's a different kind of business. Co-op members are owners and success is shared with everyone. Your co-op doesn't benefit one person or one corporation. Your co-op was built for everyone. Your co-op was built for your community. Learn more about co-op and find a location near you at co-op.crs. Thank you so much to the Canadian Centre for Addictions for sponsoring this episode. If you or a loved one are struggling with addictions, please go to the link in the show notes or you can call 1-855-971-0515. Canadian Center for Addictions is a private addiction care that's tailored to your needs. Going to an addiction rehab center doesn't mean your life has to grind to a halt. At CCFA, they tailor your recovery so you can remain connected to your life and responsibilities in the world outside so your transition to a normal life is as smooth as possible. Their drug rehab treatment plans are personalized to offer every visitor the best possible outcome. The number again is 855 855- Nine seven one zero five one five, or go to the link in the show notes. Depersonalization. Yes. Yes. Okay, that was terrifying. That was something that happened when I think I was twenty two when it happened. Oh, okay. So yeah. It's before the OCD. Yeah, but before it was before, and I still get it every once in a while, but um, I know how to like calm my body down, so. Since I was always, like, in fight or flight my whole life, pretty much, like, like my anxiety was high, you know? And then when I was in my 20s, I started, like, clinging to worry, I guess. Like, if I was worried about something, I would hold on to that and worry actively about it because it felt like it was going to change something. And I've since learned that is not at all true. (laughs) That doesn't help at all. (laughs) <laughs> but I was like really doing that a lot. And I was exercising a lot, but like over exercising because my family doesn't have the best um, relationship with food and exercise. So this is my, my time where I was like over exercising, kind of like strange about food and stuff. So I was, was doing it, was that. Was that a disorder? Like, did you have an eating disorder or anything? <laughs> it, I don't know. It's hard to say because I wasn't anorexic. I wasn't bulimic. Okay. I guess now they I've heard I've heard it be called like like non purging bulimia where like you eat but then you have to exercise it all off. Oh, I see. You okay. know, so yes, I would say it was disordered eating for sure. I just don't know if it had a name. Right. Okay. Yeah. You were o- overcompensating anyway. Yeah, and it was like too much on my body. So like I was constantly and I was doing like martial arts, so it was like very high intensity stuff. So. Which, again, it's so funny because that's really good for you moderately, you know, like you should be working. But I was working out so much, like I was just constantly like at a, like a heightened state, you know, like my body like couldn't calm down. And then one day I was at dinner with a friend and I had experienced this before where like when I'm under like, um, what's that, fluorescent lights, I'll like kind of like get really nervous and have to like go outside like it's just this weird thing so I was and then like all the noise in the restaurant will become really loud and like all the background noise is like really loud in my ears all of a sudden so that happened and I like we had to leave the restaurant and then it happened before but it goes away really quick normally right so that night I went home 
and it didn't go away and it didn't go away for like a year or two. It's like, I was just stuck like that. <clears throat> and like the, and I didn't know what it was. I had no name for it again, which is why I like to talk about it. So people will have a name for it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is very scary. Not knowing what's happening. Um, basically it felt like I was in a computer game, like my whole life. So like, you know, when you're like, like playing a first person shooter game and there's like that separation, you know, like there's a screen and then there's you. It feels like the entire world looks like that. Like, it feels like you're not real. Like you're not really like, I would just constantly say, I don't, I feel like I'm not here right now. And Mm. like your nervous system gets so like, touchy like any noise would just like make me jump or like it got to the point where I could barely go out of the house like it was so bad and nothing looked everything just looked weird like I know some people when they smoke weed they feel like that like they'll get that really detached feeling Mm -hmm. it was like that feeling but all the time right all the time I've had that after like some kind of like big traumatic moment or something like when someone dies or something and you're just like, you're just going through the motions yes. and it doesn't feel like you're doing it. And it's like, how the hell did I even drive home? Like, you know, cause you don't feel like it. So, but, so I think people like on short stints for, you know, what, how, however your body reacts, I think some people might relate yeah. because they've had a brief moment of it, but yeah, to have that for like 24 months, <laughs> that's, it's too much. That would be scary. That would it's be, too much. Be like, yeah. Am I real? Like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Like, why do I feel yeah. like this? Like, I would, I thought like I was losing my mind. Like I was going to like recess back into myself and just go catatonic or something. Like it was very, hmm. very scary. I explained it to one of my friends once. I was like, you know, that moment when like you almost get in a car accident and everything slows down for you so like you know the world slows down so you can make all your decisions really quickly I was like I'm living in that and I can't get out of it (laughs) and it's not right (laughs) it's terrifying so thank god like finally I found somebody who had gone through that like and they put a name to it they said it was depersonalization it's part of like anxiety disorders and the the best way I actually the only thing that got me out of it was um, guided meditations. Hmm. So that's like I'm always telling people meditate, meditate. Like I I always thought it was you know whatever, and then I had to do it and it changed. It like saved my life because I didn't I couldn't live you know. I always so, fall asleep. That's okay. Sometimes you need to fall asleep. That's true. You know, <laughs> it's not guided though. That's just me, my chair. Like, well, sometimes I guess I'll put earbuds in and then like, <laughs> next, you know, I'm like, oh, fuck. now I'm all groggy and shit. <laughs> <laughs> I anyway. do that too sometimes, but <laughs> what, what, um, what I was told is there was a website called anxiety center dot something. And it really helped me. They said, do guided meditations twice a day, 20 minutes each, once at noon, once at the evening time or the around dinner or whatever. And I was so bad. I was like, again, I put it off forever. Like I just put it off, put it off. And then finally I told my husband, I was like, yeah, I need to be doing that. And he was like, no, do it. It's the same thing. He was like, no, really do it. I was like, Hey, okay. (laughs) So I did. And it doesn't work right away. Like it didn't at all work right away, but I will say like at the beginning, I took my first nap in like five years because I was listening to it and it felt so good because my body was so tired. Like I didn't even realize how bad I was treating it, you know? Right. And I would say after like a few months, I had like five seconds where I forgot about the personalization. Hmm which was huge because I, there wasn't a second that I wasn't aware of it for like that whole amount of time. I can't remember if it was one year, year and a half or two, because I don't remember when I started um, healing from it. Mm -hmm. And then after like six months, I, I had huge chunks of time where I felt normal. And I think it was after a year of doing them consistently every single day, um, that I felt normal again. 
Hmm. And even to this day, like if, if I'm not, if I don't do them at all for a while, like I'll start to feel weird. Like, Oh, I'm not here. Like, ah, shit, I need to take a minute. Or, um, if I'm really tired, I'll start to feel like that. But I'm, since I'm aware of what it is, I can either take a minute, like do some breathing, um, exercises, or I can just be like, I need to go to sleep. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, that's, it's nice having that self-realization and like, like you said, having like, I've had people tell me they don't like labels to things. And it was like, I loved getting my ADHD assessment and being like, this is what you have because yeah. now it, well, it validates it. And then I'm much more self-aware when I'm doing something that's ADHD ish and be like, oh, okay, this is what's happening. And this is what my brain's doing. And this is why it's doing it. And I can, yeah. <laughs> you, <Yes. don't> say. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. you can snap out of it or whatever. There, there's such peace that comes with the diagnosis, I think, because then you have something to work with. Because be before I got diagnosis, diagnoses, diagnoses, I, like I said, I had no idea what was going on. I thought it was just broken and there's no, no hope. You know, what do you do with like, just all of a sudden your brain doesn't work like, or maybe it's not you, maybe it's just the whole world changed or something. Right. Yeah, but yeah. When, once once you know it's something in your brain, what it is, and then that there's actually a path to like heal from it, that is amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like I said, and then you realize when it's happening, it's like, oh, I know this feeling. It's familiar. Okay, yeah. okay, I got to do some maintenance again or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, are you on any medications for mm -hmm. any of the stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm on Prozac for – um. I think initially that was for the OCD and depression and that may have helped a little bit. It was kind of hard to say and, but I was still really struggling with depression. So they put, they added Seroquel to it and that helped a lot um, mixed with the Prozac, whatever that did in my brain really, really helped. So I've been on that for a few years. I don't think I'm going to get off it anytime soon. Um, do you mind me asking the dosage of Seroquel? Um, yes, I think I'm on a hundred milligrams. Okay. Yeah. That's so really low too intense. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, um, Seroquel, like when it's, when it's for like schizophrenia, it's like 800 milligrams or something. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, I take one little one and even I split it. It's that's actually good. used for, uh, uh, sleep aid. Yeah. 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 Cause I'll, I'll lay in bed and my brain will just go and <laughs> think about, you know, just like, Oh God, yeah. it's replaying the entire day. And I'm, you know, now I'm replaying it, but also making everything worse because it's, you know, it's under, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm make I'm creating the things that were happening through the day worse. And this is what I should have said. And if I had said that, <laughs> whereas I take a Sarah Quill and it's like, you know, about half an hour later, it's like, I'm out. That's what people say about it. It's funny because I don't feel like it helps me get to sleep. But if I don't take it, I cannot sleep. So I'm like, okay, well, it did the reverse on me. Now I'm in trouble if I ever run out. I tried coming off it a couple times. It's like, eh. Yeah, maybe nah. not. Uh, yeah, I'm taking such a tiny bit. What's it going to hurt? <laughs> it's yeah. like, what the hell? Yeah. I mean, mm. if it helps. Like, the, the only medication that I've ever had to get off was... um. Clon birth control no <laughs> sorry no. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know why i said that <laughs> why not um, no it's clonopin because which is like xanax and that that's what they gave me actually when i had to personalization and that helped that's what also alerted me to the fact that it was like an anxiety thing so I was taking it every day and it would help. It helped me get through the day. And then I went to a new psychiatrist and he was like, you can't be on this every day. You got to get off. And I was like, no, it helps. And he was like, sorry. So that's more of a temporary medication. Yeah. Well, you get addicted. It's a benzo. So like you get really addicted to them really fast. Right. Right. Hmm. Apparently. Yeah. Uh, well, it sounds like you have a pretty good husband. Yeah. He's good. <laughs> pretty supportive and yeah. uh, kicks your ass when you need a kicking and not a kick, but you know what I mean? No. Yeah. He's yeah. very, we're very upfront with each other. So yeah. If I'm like dawdling around something, he'll definitely tell me. It's that time again for that somebody special segment where we chat about who cooperated in your mental health journey and helped fill your emotional tank brought to you by co-op. 
This is a segment where you get to give a shout out to someone that's been in your corner when you've needed it. Oh, the person that's been there for me the most is absolutely my husband, Taylor. Um, we've known each other since we were teenagers, and he's seen me through all my mental breakdowns, and he's just very stable. He's like a, a rock that I can keep returning to when things get crazy, and he's so very patient. He always, he always, um, he always sees the other side of it, even when I don't. When I don't think that a bad bout's going to end, he always is there to say, it's going to end. Just do what you're supposed to do, and it will end. It'll get better. And he's really great about that. I love him. This has been another Somebunny special brought to you by Co-op. Get an ADHD assessment. I know. I know. I just, You know what? The th- I'm listening to you, and I'm like, this chick has ADHD. You know, what, what tips it off? Uh, well, I, I think there's a lot of overlap with some of the stuff with the OCD and with the anxiety and stuff like, um, so I think, well, even like you said, you're, you, you're not a very tidy person and just, I don't know, just lots of stuff. And then, oh, even like you're, you were dragging your feet to even get, go to treatment or you're dragging your feet to do the treatment, even once you did learn the treatment and yeah, procrastination and stuff. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a professional. I don't of know course, what the hell I'm talking about, but with someone that was just recently diagnosed, I'm, I, I can relate to a lot to what you're saying. You're <laughs> the details. Right. I just get this thing where I, it's so trendy right now for people to be like, I'm neurodivergent. You know, I like, I don't I ever like hop on the bandwagon and be like, me too. You know, like with. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> I mean, I totally get it. I totally get it. Uh, you know, I was like, but if that's but if what I you have, have <laughs> 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 cats are so trendy. I don't want, I'm not getting, I'm not going to get a dial. No, not dialysis. Biopsy. Yeah. I'm not getting a biopsy. Everybody's getting biopsies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I see a bunch of people being like, oh, obviously I have, I have autism or ADHD. I'm like, no, you don't. So then I'm like, I want to be like that, but. Yeah. Maybe. But I mean, if you're actually assessed. Yeah. Okay. Fair. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people say they have it or well, they even, well, you know, people that are like, I'm so OCD right now. Dude. Like, mm. Cause that was trendy for a long time too. Right? It was, it drives me crazy. Sometimes my close friends say it too, and I'm just, I just like, I'm just gonna let that go. I'm like, you have no idea. <laughs> you <don't> know. <laughs> yes. I have to have the forks all lined up nicely. I have to. I'm OCD. It's like, oh, for you. Oh, no, that's not OCD, lady, <laughs> or, or whoever's saying it. But yeah. Yeah. But yeah, um, my husband's really good with it. He's a very grounded person and very patient. So he's, he's been a great help. Yeah, bad. my wife too. <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I we I, I should. I've been told I shouldn't say that stuff. It's like we are just as lovable as anyone else. You know, don't be like, oh, my wife's a saint for being with me. You know, because mm-hmm. that, that makes it sound like we're we don't have self worth, right? Right. Well, no, we have like the magic that comes from people with mental disorders, like. <laughs> We're like love fairies. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, my wife of, should be. The amount of hugs I give my husband is insane. <laughs> We're passionate folk. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so uh so what all the other disorders you got? Or did we cover them all? <laughs> <laughs> I <read> them. <laughs> oh good, good. <laughs> and and uh and you're also I I'll say an artist. I know a lot of musicians don't call themselves artists, but uh, yeah, I mean that's uh, again with this these kind of um, disorders and stuff, and again ADHD. A lot of neurodivergent folks are very <laughs> creative. Um, wh- wh- what's your band like? Are they on um, s- streaming things, iTunes or whatever the hell it's called? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're on streaming things. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have yourself an album? Yeah, we got an album. Got two. We're recording oh, nice. for next week. Uh, yeah, we're called Graves and the Bad Weather. So Graves, my last name, and the Bad Weather, because I read a lot about the mental stuff, you know, the bad things or the hard things at the very least. So, yeah, that's that's been a really cool, um, like, I, I'm never grateful to have 
like OCD or any of that stuff, but I, I am grateful that it's allowed me to have a certain perspective and be able to reach out and help people that go through the same thing that are like, like less likely to be vocal about it, you know, or a little bit more shy. So mm -hmm. yeah, our, um, our last two albums, they're a lot about, about the, the mental health and just getting like getting through the hard times. How cool is it that your last name is Graves? I love that. So it technically, when I got married, it changed, but like publicly, I like Graves because Graves is cool. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leandra. It's very much appreciated that you came on the podcast, told your story. And uh, if you want to reach out to her, please check out the show notes. Her music and her band is called Graves and the Bad Weather. I'm sure she would love to hear from you. While you're checking her out, you can also check out Sticks and Doodles. They are an amazing company that do 3D engraving wood signs and stuff. And they have ornaments and they, they do all types of really, really cool stuff. Custom stuff for weddings or for your cottage or for your business, whatever you want. Uh, they made me a beautiful sign. Uh, it sits behind me and you can see it if you go to my YouTube channel uh, in the intros of my YouTube uh, it's 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 fairly recent, so some of the videos don't have it, but uh, you can check them out at sticksanddoodles.ca or sticksanddoodles on Instagram. Uh, please go check them out. And if you're looking for some kind of charity that you 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 want to donate to, uh, but you, you know you, you're not sure, I'm telling you, Cornwall Alternative School in Regina, Saskatchewan, not only would appreciate it, but they really need it. It's a high school just full of beautiful people, beautiful staff, and they they deal with children that don't quite fit in other schools. They have either mental health issues or, or whatever. But by, by helping Cornwall Alternative School, you'll be helping youth. You'd be helping mental health. You'd be helping education. I mean, there's it's endless the amount of things and supports that that school provides. So please consider that. CornwallAlternativeSchool.com. Donate today. And hey, thank you, Wit and Ellie from This Is Actually Happening podcast. Uh, they gave me a shout out this week. Uh, there was a former guest of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health on their podcast. Her name is Amy Ronhar. She has a fantastic story. So if you want to check out that story, you can either listen to This Is Actually Happening or go through the library here and find it. Uh, she's got a, a book for sale and everything. So uh, she's an amazing guest too. So thank you for that. And thank you for Ellie and T from Trauma Bonded podcast. Uh, you guys are just really cool and doing really cool stuff. So thank you. And if you need a speaker to talk about anything from mental health to addictions, or ADHD to uh, just a silly looking guy with a beard, please reach out to me at bunnyhugspodcast at gmail.com. I can be virtual. I can do it in person. It can be pre-recorded, whatever. I love doing it. I'm doing these kind of things all the time and I love it. So uh, please consider me and please stay tuned for next week. Uh, there's more amazing episodes coming up with more incredible guests. Speaking of Whit Misseldine from This Is Actually Happening, I heard next week's guest on that show. His name is John Romano, and he is a former school shooter. He spent 17 years in prison. Uh, he's going to be on the show. We're going to talk to him about what drove him to do that and what his life looks like now. Uh, he's got a fascinating story. I'm telling you, it's fascinating. Uh, not only was he uh, a perpetrator, but he was also an, an extreme victim of violence. An extreme victim? A victim of extreme violence. We'll get on to all that next week. But until then, please remember to make your beds and take your meds. Bye. <laughs>